What is up, everybody? My name is Richard Terrell. I go by Kirby Kid, and you are watching the Metroid Dread Deep Dive Week 1 stream uh, on our Discord channel, which you can find at designoriented.net. We discussed Metroid throughout the entire week. Um, the first week was, or the first day was mechanics, uh, the second day was enemy elements, and the next day was power ups. And essentially, we were going down the list and breaking down elements of the game that exist uh, using various methods and various criteria, but ultimately trying to get a better understanding of some of the basic building blocks that comprise Metroid Dread. Uh, this game is really complicated. It's you know it's fresh, it's hot, it's new. People are playing it. People are comparing it to other Metroid games and other Metroidvanias. And uh, being such a, a long, having such a long legacy, and being such a complex game, there's going to be no quick discussion that gets deep enough into the heart of Metroid that you can have in any one sitting. So we took it throughout the week to prepare for a stream like this. Next week we're going to hit the hard topics. We're going to talk about. Uh, feedback design, level design, boss design, and sort of some macro level uh, Metroid concerns next week. But this week is setting up for that, so it's good that you're tuning in now. Uh, let me show you what our Discord looks like. Let's see. Yeah. So on our Discord channel, right here, uh, we have a channel on the side called Daily Challenges, and whenever we break down super big topics like this, you'll find every single prompt on the Daily Challenge section. So we have one for day one up here, we're just talking about Metroid, here's day two, here's a prompt for day four and day five and so on. And then we put all of our answers in this one channel called the Daily Challenges chat. Uh, so as you can see here, we've dropped a lot of examples, a lot of funny GIFs, uh, screenshots, examples, descriptions, breakdowns, and to the best of our ability, just starting the whole process of better understanding what Metroid is composed of. Uh, so we're going to run through a few of these, talk a little bit about it. It's a little bit uh, unstructured and off the cuff, but I'll show you a little bit of what we've been building. And from there, uh, we will take the conversation wherever it goes. So let me scroll to the top of the Metroid right here. Yeah, so on, on the chat. On the mic, I got my brother Marcus, and uh, anybody else who shows up in the Discord channel is free to chat with us. And if you are on Twitch, yep, you can also talk with us on the stream if you have any questions, comments, or whatever. Um, so one of the cool things about the Discord channel, you know, you can go back and read all this yourself uh, at your own pace, but essentially, we gave our overall impressions of Metroid Dread. Um, had a paragraph or two describing what we think of the game. Uh, most of us beat it. And then we have questions that we have lingering over that we want answered in a deep dive conversation. So, um, you know, how could enemies have been scarier? Uh, enemy design kind of question. Could they integrate unique uses for the techniques better? Like shine sparking would be cool to see more than one time use for that. So like uh, level design here. Didn't, this person didn't play with sound most of the time. Maybe that affected their experience. <laughs> like, how can enemies be scarier? You turn on your sound, Matt. <laughs> uh, but anyway, Zara gave his impressions. Marcus gave his impressions. Um, there's going to be cool topics discussed next week in terms of the good and the bad of this Neo or new boss design. Um, lots of specific things to draw examples from. So it's going to be really interesting and fun to talk about that. But also... Topics like what is a good way to, what is a good why, haha, <laughs> to talk about level progression in the game, that's level design. What's the best way to break up the map for further understanding, right? The map in this game is its own topic. Uh, it falls under the topic of feedback, and if you're ever curious about uh, what these little icons are and what they mean, you know, at Design Oriented, which I will design oriented on that right here. Hmm. You can come here and you can see that we have a design-oriented topic wheel. It's a, basically a big color-coded glossary of game design terms to help you break down and understand games. Uh, we got a list version of it here, uh, which is just an open Google sheet for anyone to look at. Uh, and, and also a glossary of terms from my old blog, Critical Gaming. Uh, but yeah, whenever we're talking about topics, whenever we're talking about color coding or anything like that, uh, we got this really detailed system that breaks things down very precisely. And as you can see, feedback here is, 
how information about the game state is communicated to the player, usually in response to player actions. It includes visual, auditory, and tactile elements, all kinds of feedback. Uh, and the map is also a, a feature. Uh, in this case, this map feature comes with other cool things like putting way markers down and, and, and automatically generated icons. But yeah, that's just one example of a topic and some of the subtopics that we would talk about and trying to wrap our brains around it. Uh, but if you're curious on what our Discord is, you can find it on our main website here. Uh, here's a topic wheel and other juicy, interesting links for you to, to take a look at. Ooh, so if we back up a little bit, let me see right here and go to, this is a spreadsheet that I keep of all of my gaming history, all the games I've played, how long I played them and how I rank certain things. Um, if we go by series and find Metroid somewhere on this list, probably skipped it already. Or I can just control F right here, right one past Pikmin. You know, there's a lot of games in the Metroid series and I've played every single one of them. Super Metroid, Metroid Dread, Zero Mission, Metroid Retur Samus Returns for 3DS, Fusion for GBA, Other M for Wii, Prime for GameCube, Prime Hunters for DS, Metroid 2 Return of Samus for Game Boy, the original, Metroid the original, um, Federation Force we even played, <laughs> uh, and Prime 3 I didn't beat, and Echoes I didn't beat, but they're at the bottom of my appreciation list so you can understand why. Uh, those are also 3D Metroids, which is an entirely other topic. Even if we stick to 2D Metroid design, uh, we got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight different games to talk about. Uh, that's just one reason why Metroid is such a complex topic and a difficult series to talk about. There's so many things you can compare it to from within its own series, let alone uh, uh, compared to others in this genre or similar genres. So if we go to my rank by Metroid, by rank by genre, you can see a list roughly of, um, where is it? Right here, Metroidvania, it's type games. I just put the Metroid series uh, above basically all of these. <laughs> above Hero Core, which is a really cool shoot -em up style Metroidvania. Guacamelee, which is a more brawler style. Uh, Metroidvania type thing, Hollow Knight, uh, Castlevania Dawn of Sorrow, uh, In 60 Seconds, which was an old indie game that you play the whole Metroidvania in 60 seconds, which is really funny, and games like Gato Robata, which I played on the Switch. So lots of games in this vein, and uh, Metroid is the king. So one of the cool reasons why we're doing this deep dive is to really try to explain why Metroid is at the top of the list, at least at the top of my list. Um, so that's why we're taking this super... Uh, protracted, extended discussion format. But yeah, Mark, is there anything you want to say off the top? Do you want to like recap some of your, <laughs> you want to recap some of your um, thoughts on the game overall? You can just read your paragraph if you want. Yeah. <clears throat> Where are the I didn't think my uh, anything my past. It was just like a jotting down of notes. Mm. Maybe we can get <clears throat> illuminate, or as we go through this, it'll make more and more sense. But where? Ooh, man, it's a lot of. Oh, I think I came up with a better word for it. In my little write up. But it combines the old school action design of the Metroid game with the new trends. Mm. The addition of the new is created well enough so it doesn't draw any direct comparisons with any other game. Essentially, we were talking about this before with some of the reviews, some of the newer players coming to this game. You know, Metroid is essentially a game type that Nintendo doesn't have a lot of. They haven't made in kind of a while. So a lot of people used to new, close to Nintendo, who weren't ready for the Face slap at least the Metro series is unforgiving. Me. Yeah. yeah. A lot of people are expecting a Metroidvania. <laughs> people have to be lovingly told that it's a Metro game, not a Metroidvania. <laughs> that augment your uh, 
skills with RPG leveling. You would be better yourself. If you be good. Blah, blah, which is you know Dark Souls kind of mantra. But like I said in my little write up, like no one said this is the Dark Souls of Metroidvania. Like, because Metroid, yeah, it's Metroid. Because <laughs> what you did all the way back in 1987. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, uh, True. Check out, but yeah, the word uh, kind of takeaway. The word one word. I want to describe Dread is it's a legacy game, more so than any other Nintendo game besides Mario games, in which Mario games can just like take whole cloth from another Mario game and shove it in there and have it work. It's essentially Dread is like it's the culmination of a bunch of stuff the series has been doing previously and they jammed most of it in there. Yeah, pretty pretty impressive package. Um, uh, for me, Metroid games are a lot like Zelda games. Um, like, they start off, obviously start off slower at the beginning. Uh, you don't have many of your powers, you don't know the controls, you don't, you're really not engaging with the unique uh, thing of the game right away. Um, so it's really got to sell itself to me over time. And, uh, you know, by the middle of the game, by shortly after the beginning, you know, I'm really sinking into it. But yeah, definitely by the middle and into the, the rest of the game experience, I'm just jamming, right? Like everything's clicking, everything's working together. And that is that is not to be understated, because uh, like you said, the the Vania part of Metroidvania, uh, really, the biggest thing, the most distinct thing that that adds to the fusion combo is RPG elements, right? Which can include things like excessive weapons, items, uh, inventory management, but mostly EXP stat leveling, so that you do the same thing over and over, or just get generic EXP, and your character will get stronger, and then it's just like a damage and hit points rat race where you're like will you be strong enough uh to hit this enemy in this hallway even though the fundamental gameplay is pretty much the same so that's my least favorite part about rpg elements that have stats and things like that and usually when they creep up into metrovanias i'm not too thrilled uh, it's not too exciting it's not too interesting and there's a lot of reasons why but one of the reasons that's most distinct when compared to true metroid games is metroid builds on itself um, it's an action game. Like, through and through, the, the main thing you do in this game is exactly what you see on the screen here. You just walk forward and shoot stuff, right? And it never betrays that core. So by the end of the game, when when you don't have stats to rely on to make your character feel stronger, it's really got to be player skill. It's the stuff you notice. It's the stuff you practice. It's the stuff you think. It's the timing of those uh, actions that you do. And all that just adds up to one sort of forward momentum building experience. So that's what I love about skill-based games, and nobody does it like Metroid. It's why it spawned its own genre. Um, but to say a few things about the original Metroid, that game is bad. <laughs> it's so it's so cool because for an NES game back in 1987, which is when I was born, around then, I think either a year before or after that, because Mario, Metroid, Zelda all came out around that time. Um, the, even the original onset, the outset of this game series had crazy hallways like this, like, you know, reticulated hubs and spoke, long platforming hallways. It had creepy crawly enemies that can defy gravity and stuff. It had dynamic blocks that can appear and be destroyed and reappear. It had the bomb form missiles. It had um ice missiles and standing on enemies in an nes game that's dynamic like that's crazy right because if you've ever played enough nes games most of them suck and most of them are poorly programmed and most of them really nowadays don't convey the sense that it's like a coherent game environment but then you get games like balloon fight and mario and zelda and they're like wow okay pro at least program wise this game's solid but what metroid did was a lot of fancy new tricks that are hardly seen in other NES games on the platform. But yeah, the game is hard. The game is so unforgiving. Like the, the All you kids out there don't even realize how hard it is to play a game without a save state, a save file, even having the ability to save your game on the cartridge. We didn't have that with the original Metroid. So we have to memorize passwords and write them down. And for all intents and purposes, the original Metroid was a lot more like a roguelike <laughs> because you know, it's short enough to be played in one sitting, as all the Metroids are, once you start getting really good. That's kind of like a, a cool feature. Um, but when you die in that game, 
it can really disorient you for one because it puts you back in your last kind of like save station even though they're not really saving your last energy recharge station but also they don't refill any of your ammo or your health beyond like the bare minimum it takes to walk out of that room without dying and enemies do so much damage and they drop so little health it's almost as if you need to restart the game just to figure out how to get back on your um footing and uh in that original game, you can also explore areas kind of out of order, right? Uh, but the fact is, the game had a lot of cool ideas that are still within the series today, except for it was too hardcore for its own good. Now, relatively speaking, if there's no other games on the planet to play, Metroid is perfect, right? Like, if there's if there's no modern games to play, you don't have SNES, N64, and all the way up, and a history of games to play on PC and everything else, then... I could see us having a lot more patience playing a game like that and taking it a lot more slowly and um, and kind of dealing with it on its own terms. But we can't go back in time. Nobody's going to deal with that anymore. This new Metroid, Metroid Dread, is a, like Marcus said, a kind of a fusion between old school design like that, new school design. But also, I believe that this game is the cap. This is like the final result of the original design paradigms that Metroid started on the NES. So all those things I talked about, like Morph Ball and things, are in this game, and the map operates largely the same, and the gameplay is largely the same, where you can shoot up, and you can shoot down while crouching, you can ball form and lay bombs, like, that's the same as an NES game, and yet Dread adds a few twists, um, shakes the formula up a little bit, but ultimately just says, hey, what's a next-gen version of that old NES game that that uh, you guys made, you guys being Nintendo, uh, all the way back when, and that's what I think makes a really interesting conversation for figuring out what the heck this game is. <sighs> that was a lot of junk I said, but yeah, I like Metroid a lot. I didn't even realize how much I liked it a lot, right, until you realize, uh, oh, I beat Metroid Federation Force, and I actually like it, so <laughs> that says a lot <laughs> about what I'm willing to put up with. Bad graphics, jeez. Yeah, the kind of influx of Metroidvanias, which I don't care for almost at all. I don't, I don't really care for. <laughs> Maybe you think I need to care for Metroid lights, but like, wait a second, I like almost all the Metroid lights that play. Like you said, in 60 seconds. And, mm. uh, you never played Hero Core, but that was a cool one. Yeah, Seymour Dig, which is not really one. I'm gonna call it one. Might as well. <laughs> But uh, yeah, it's interesting uh, kind of the culmination, the finality of 2D Metroid. Zimmerly, oh, be spoiling it. No, I was gonna look there eventually. <laughs> that was like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Zimmerly, I don't know if 2D Mario has like a, a next thing to do either. Yeah, you did Mario Maker and. For Mario 2D proper, like I don't know if there's anything beyond. Yeah. We had the place, so. Mario Maker opened the floodgates in terms of all that variety that's possible for each user to make, right? And um, Nintendo's not going to make the crazy levels, so it leaves the users up to make those. But then Nintendo also supplied a hundred really good levels of Mario Maker, and then once you play those, you're like, man, not only is this engine capable a lot, but if you take that as like the starting point, I don't know what else Mario 2D can do. It's done multiplayer. It's done many different campaigns, many different power-ups, many different kind of graphical styles. Yeah. The only thing it hasn't done is like take Smash Brothers like complexity and its mechanics and controls and then make a Mario game around that, which is sounds nuts, but I'm I want it. It's it's also why people didn't like New Super Mario Brothers 2. If you're looking for some pizzazz, something like really obvious and striking in terms of what you're looking for in your next Mario game, that game isn't it. What that game was was a nice addition, really unique polished levels, uh, interesting enough multi co-op multiplayer, but a really, really cool score attack mode or coin rush, right? Uh, and that's why I love New Super Mario Bros. 2. It's pretty high on my list. It killed an enemy before their screen transitioned. So, when I was thinking about the Metroid series in college, this is back in 2000 and... 
six, the fall of 2006, maybe the spring of 2007, I remember thinking about what makes Metroidvania or Metroid games good. And I sat there and I was like, I think I got it. Like, I think when people make Metroid style games, by people I mean indies mostly. Oh, hey, Lol's World, what's up? <laughs> um, when people make Metroid games, they focus way too much on the big picture. Like, even though Metroid, even on the original NES game, had a big map that they didn't show you. You have to draw your own map. And if I pull up a picture, maybe I can show you what my originally hand-drawn Metroid map looks like. Uh, but yeah, like the original game supplied this big interconnected uh, platforming world. And a lot of people, when they make Metroid games, over-focus on that aspect. And they, they make huge worlds and they connect them, but then there's not really anything super interesting or fun to do uh, because of that big picture and it's not really fun to travel in between and like go along your way to get to the different areas to reveal the big picture it's really just flat um but at the core of metroid is all it is is this really good controls metroid's always had good controls uh for an action game you you're going to be running moving shooting aiming that's the primary your bombs are a nice delayed attack that stick in space which is really cool so you can attack air enemies, ground enemies. Uh, you can put a trail of them, stun enemies. Um, the original Metroid, the blaster stunned enemy movement. So you could really just um, slow down a, a fast racing enemy that's about to collide with you with your, with your shots. And as fast as you can press that button, it's part of your advantage. It's really just a, a shooting style game. It's a, a really well-made action game. And that means room to room, you got something to do. It's called move through it. That's the action, right? So that's why I think it's really cool for uh, the community to focus on the core mechanics to start. Uh, you, you got here, you can see, uh, where is it? Tutorials. No. Samus. And you can click on each one of these to get a demo, essentially. But yeah, you got you got all your core abilities, and these are some of them are broken down in the Discord. But essentially, most of these are focused on shooting things, shooting, 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 aiming, and kind of swinging, kind of shooting, shooting, shooting your missiles. These new Aeon abilities are about in, like how your relationship to the environment, so like moving through it, being invisible, and finding secrets. Uh, moving gravity suit yeah you take less damage but the gravity suit is really about being able to move freely in water and the previous suit the various suit or the barrier suit is um, about resisting hot areas so like where you go and how you move is important then morph ball is a type of movement small slow uh, bomb power bomb cross bomb. these are all attacking things that you can do a morph ball and then climbing on things, running fast, jumping twice, and then jumping infinite times. Moving, shooting, moving, shooting, killing, killing, exploding. That's the whole game. Um, so what's interesting about that is action games are relatively simple, especially when we describe the game in, in, as being a Metroid game and in the same vein as the original NES Metroid. The NES didn't have a lot of hardware power, so the gameplay that it carved out had to play to its strengths. And one of the things that NES hardware could do easily is platforming, uh, type of collision, and shooting, projectiles. So like Mario's really good at the platforming, Link runs around, he throws projectiles, and Samus runs around you know, with gravity but shoots more projectiles than either of them, right? So Samus is Nintendo's flagship shooty shooty style game. Um, I thought you were going to make a Simpsons joke. <laughs> well, which one? <laughs> Things that the NES is good at, not very much. You're like, you're supposed to listen to all the gameplay that Metroid isn't doing. Yeah, I can do that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I can do that on the SNES. <laughs> oh, yeah, right? Like, it, the fun is in the it's crudeness, right? That, yeah, it's so crude that it doesn't set up a uh, firm structure, so you're making your own adventure. Mm. In the original Metroid. Yeah, original Metroid. So yeah. Yeah. One thing it did really well was in that game you could aim up, 
you could crouch shoot. Could you crouch shoot? Oh yeah. And then you can. <sighs> you didn't have a. Anyway. Um, but yeah, like aiming at the enemies. They have a, a famous sinusoidal moving enemy, which is like the movement pattern of Medusa heads from the Castlevania series. Those are enemies are really hard to hit. They're really fun to time your horizontal shots with. Shooting a missile in that game is precious and powerful, but slow. So hitting things across the screen was difficult. And um, yeah, it was just fun to survive. Your shooting skills, that's what helped you survive. I wonder if I can do that face, face shift trait. Oh, you can't. But yeah, shooting is, is never really gets too much more complicated than what you see on many NES games, right? Oops, hold on, hold on. We're gonna get it. Ah, oh, too early. Destroyed. I learned that from a speedrunner. And this room gives you plenty of room to do it. The other, yeah, yeah, anyway. So, yeah, the, what's good about shoot 'em ups what's great about moving and shooting, Mega Man does moving and shooting so freaking well. Uh, and Metroid, Super Metroid, like all those games, they, that's one of the genres that the NES and the SNES could do really well. Uh, and so, this game building off the legacy of Metroid, the shooting and the controls, the snappiness, and the speed, most of all, like this game just made Samus jet. Like you're just going fast and you're smoothly converting from one thing to the other and just like, ah, just shooting everything. Like they really made this game uh, have really fun, good and complex movement for such tight spaces that you're in all the time. And, and that's to its credit, that's cool. Uh, but yeah, but the game is always about just moving and shooting. So you're never gonna find enemies that are like too, too complex um, enemies, that's in non-bosses. You're never going to find situations that are so confusing navigationally that you have to stop and be like, what am I doing? Like, no, the, the forward momentum of the game, like an action game, is moving forward. Why doesn't this connect? Okay. This is my uh, speedrun file. So I 100%ed another file, and now I'm just kind of like, what? what's happening? Why don't I have everything unlocked? Uh, but yeah, connecting rooms, moving smoothly, aiming well and then keeping that going. And that's the secret sauce that makes Metroid so good. Um, everyone loves this big map macro stuff. Everyone loves the fact that the, the game's interconnected and that you can find like shortcuts between some areas and other areas. Like that's, that's core Metroid through and through. But the reason why you can, the reason why everyone is so fond of it and people think about it so distinctly it's because the core gameplay is you know deep enough and good enough but simple enough that they can turn their they can always have some of their attention devoted to the big picture so whenever you're in this hallway like look at this hallway not too and it's not straightforward because it's got a curve right it's got a little nook over there and a jump point over here but for gameplay purposes like you can just like go right through this and go right up and none of this bothers you right however because it's easy to navigate through and it's easy for you to chart where you want to go and get there, your brain has a little bit of extra power to think like this in the top right corner, which I won't make this bigger for stream because I probably should have anyway. Um, your brain has just a little bit more power to look at your map, to be aware of your map, to be like, I'm in the bottom left knuckle of a of a green section that's attached to an enemy room. And then you look at your map and, and even though you'll often stop and pause and look at the map and try to find out where you want to go, it is very crucial that you have extra brain power to put this ant farm looking thing in your head. This whole section right that I'm in has three connectors to the middle shaft, right? But it has one long winding thing to the outside and a, a long winding thing up into the upper area. So if I'm just playing and I'm going as fast as I can, right now I'm just thinking long windy, long windy, long windy, upper area. Well, this area is more upper than that one. So I'm gonna go in this one and then you can check your map or you can just go with the flow and be like, that that level looks like, this area looks like it's harder to get into. I'm just gonna go in this easier area, just kind of keep moving. And I kind of learned the map and then, um, 
yeah, so having that extra brain power to be conscious of this, aware of it, to put it in your head, to help it help you navigate and to get where you need to go while experiencing like a like a continuous kinetic action game, like that's what Metroid does so much better than everybody else. So the gameplay had to be relatively simple for that to even be possible. You don't want every room to be a puzzle. Your brain stops, shuts down, and reevaluates, dumps all the old info because it's a puzzle that requires your attention. And then you, you solve it however you can and you go in the next room and repeat it. You're like, you'll forget that you're in a big environment if you do that, if they did that with the gameplay. Where am I going? Why not? So, uh, so when we're looking at enemies, when we're looking at the design of Metroid, the enemies aren't going to be too, like, I don't know. You look at Mario enemies, they're all pretty understandable. They're all pretty sh simple. And they, they do one thing or maybe two things. Uh, they're all roughly the same size, small block or a chunkier block, really. Yet all those subtle differences mean a lot in context of emergent Mario gameplay because enemies can collide into other enemies, rebound off of other enemies, Koopa Shell kill other enemies, break bricks, weigh down platforms, like all these subtle little effects, right? But the, the initial impression of these enemies is that they're super simple. It's pretty much the same with Metroid. Uh, you get less of the cool chain reaction and environmental effects, but these enemies are designed to one, work really well in their environments. Oh, that was close. And two, provide you with this extra complexity uh, that's made most apparent when you progress through the entire game. Um, so like this enemy right here, when you first encounter him, you know, it's got a hard ex exterior, so it's kind of hard for you to um, destroy them. It's either gonna take missiles, which are hard to aim, ah. Or it's going to take um, you to kind of focus and maybe do a melee counter by getting close. But when you're this powerful, normal shots can destroy them. Your screw attack can destroy them. And that changes the way you move through old environments, right? These little blades would have been a different kind of threat at the early game. And you might have to time your jump. You might have to get out of ball form or do some... What? What was that? Oh, did you know that? I didn't know it ramped off bomb. Oh, well, let's test this. And, oh, that's cool. So maybe I can just like set, oh, what a nice defense. Let me do a, oh, it's the explosion too, because I did a uh, line bomb, or what do you want to call that? Oh, that's neat. Maybe I can melee it. No, there's blades. <laughs> but yeah, like it's little subtle things like that. If you encounter that enemy before you get bombs, you can't know that. If you encounter that enemy after you get bombs, you might discover it. And if you encounter that enemy when you're in game, you might ignore it. But like that potential, that complexity, that sort of layered design with the enemies, it's just something that's baked through and through with basically all the enemies. It's what the game is. So even though the gameplay looks pretty straightforward and it's pretty simple, action game wise, there's still more going on with these simple looking kind of dumb enemies than in basically every other Metroidvania series, if you want to go there. I wonder what this hat was. It? Yeah. Huh? Look. Oh, you can jump on. Ah, oh, you can jump on the ice, but I'm way too powerful and I killed it. So yeah, that's that's the other key takeaway. Well, we can look a little bit more closely at uh, some enemies, some power ups. Like this week, we're talking today. We're talking about power ups. So basically, like the difference between your normal shot, your spread shot, your uh, what is this called? Wave beam, diffusion beam, grapple, uh, those two, the difference between charging and not charging, right? And how when Samus gets new abilities, how does it change the way that you play the game? Because the definition of a power-up is something that gives you power. <laughs> power is an ability that you leverage to, into your advantage. So essentially, by nature, power-ups make the game easier. So like... Does, and there's nothing wrong with that. So even though the game, these things make the game easier, the real question is, does it make it more interesting, right? Like, even if it's less, uh, even if it's easier than ever not to get hit or to die, what what becomes the focus then? Like, what else becomes interesting, or what else can you discover with your new abilities? Cool. 
unprecedented for them to do. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I was looking for it. I was, I'm looking. Uh, where is it? Where's my treat for knowing this? You said this was a legacy game. Ah! Samus is so fast. This this flash shift is so fast. <laughs> like I've never seen a character move like that in a game. Well, I've seen some. It's fast. Now that I have the most powerful beam, you know, you can just hit enemies through walls and you might think, that's so easy. Here's two cool things about it. One, well, that X parasite was supposed to fly away and turn into another enemy. So the further away you shoot things with this power, the the enemies recycle in that way. But two, it changes the way you aim. Have you ever come to this part and aim diagonally back to shoot that guy? Well, not until you have the beam that goes through walls. So like initially you might come over here, jump, stand here. Oops. Stand here, size them up, shoot a missile, try to not run into them when you jump, but now you have this power. You can basically do, you can enter this room, slide and walk, oh, slide and like shoot backwards even. And then like keep moving. And then when you get down here, you can phase shift down. There's, there's no way to fast fall in this game, right? So if I phase shift, fa there's no way to like phase shift right, fall down, phase shift left. I think if I phase shift, yeah, you can phase shift in the diagonal. So that's how you get down. Oh, cool. That's cool. <laughs> but yeah, just observing the environment just a little bit more, finding details like slanted uh, walls and be like, well, what good does that do me? I just now discovered that you can phase shift slide and it's really fun to move oddly through environments and you can use that as a dodge. You can use that as, a, as an attack. That's interesting. Here's another uh, <laughs> shoot. <laughs> I'm trying to melee combo you. Battery low. My battery's low. There we go. That's cool. So like that whole situation right there. The only reason I was doing that is because I have a uh, infinite space jump, screw jump, or whatever. And obviously I could have just jumped into the enemy and killed it, but I found it more interesting to see if I could in midair like unscrew and melee attack. And that's just part of the fun of the game. Just because you have power to not die doesn't mean um, it takes away your ability to have new kinds of fun. We all know that being overpowered is fun sometimes. So it's up to Metroid as a game to layer its uh, development across the entire experience so that you feel Weak, strong, weak, strong, super strong, super weak, like whatever, you, however you want to break it down. That's kind of the goal, and that's what Metroid games do really, really well. Ah. Taking advantage of the fact that you can't phase shift and hurt yourself on an enemy, so it allows me to like do a short phase shift like that. Uh, he killed himself. I didn't do that. So that's a that's a pretty good primer. We're we're actually having a lot of these parts of these discussions throughout the week. Um, that's cool. A lot of the questions that we encounter on the list, we're just talking about. Um, so for the next week, you know, if you're interested in joining us in the Discord channel, but ultimately for the next week, we have uh, we're going to be working out of this Figma file. And I got a lot of a lot of really cool topics here. I got a map of the entire game here. And what's cool about Figma is they let you zoom in quite a lot. So we can actually be very precise about uh, the aspects of the game we're talking about. We can leave notes on specific areas. Uh, where is, where's this area? This is Darien. Interesting. This is where I was talking just now with that weird funky elbow. And it, I jumped up here, screw jumped up here, went right. I skipped this area, something like that. But anyway, we have a map. I went left. We have a map. We have uh, these cool markers that I made. Uh, we have the ability to be very precise about what we talk about, which is great. We have uh, maps of all the previous Metroid games for comparison. So we got Metroid Fusion, Super Metroid. We got Return of Samus and Samus Returns. Mm, beautiful, beautiful, chunky pixels. I love it. And we got Zero Mission and the original, which, look at this. 
The original looks very different from Dread, and that's that's fun to think about. But look at this blue hallway. Are you kidding me? Copy paste much? <laughs> no, but that's, <laughs> that's just what it was. Um, we have you know reminders for the different abilities for talking about specific things. We have images of the original, all the enemies. Um, all the different types of blocks, which is going to be fun to talk about next week when we break down the level design. Amy's are their own topic. We have, and each boss is its own topic. So it's going to be a lot of fun. We got a lot of specifics to uh, move through and um, a lot of cool topics that we're going to ultimately stick the answers right onto this, um, this diagram. So what's cool about this diagram, I'm going to provide the link in the YouTube channel, but you can... Pop in, read it, zoom in, explore it. You can even leave comments and you can be a part of the discussion this way if you want. But by next Friday or by the end of next Friday, we're going to figure out what I mean by this idea of missiles are too plentiful and dread. We're going to talk a little bit about the Omega cannon ammunition, you know, why it's cool, why it's not cool, what else, what other things that could be done. We're going to talk about Metroid versus Mario blocks. So Mario has all kinds of blocks, and you can see it in Mario Maker, they got a wheel of it. But Metroid has its own collection of blocks, and we're going to talk about how they shape level design and how they encourage the player to play, just to get some basic principles uh, articulated. We're going to talk about contact less enemy design, right? And how um, one thing that NES games did not do well is contact, melee attacks, right? Um, you know, there's some games like the Ninja Turtles, Ninja Turtles 2 and stuff like that, Ninja Gaiden that has melee attacks, but for the most part it's harder for the NES to, to render the hitboxes and run it fast enough and accurately enough to actually make good, good gameplay out of it, at least with their understanding of games back then. Uh, but SNES is when fighting games and real melee focused games start to come along. Uh, Metroid's design is firmly rooted in action, running gun, shoot 'em ups and not melee, and it's interesting that Samus Returns and Metroid Dread play around with melee more so than every other, almost any other Metroid. Maybe other M, you could say this, the dodge moves, it's like a melee, but it isn't. Uh, we're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about what they tell you in a Metroid game and what they don't tell you. Because what they don't tell you is the whole like complex topic of, is it okay to get lost? Is it okay to be frustrated? Like What, what do players do when they feel like they their back's to the wall and they don't know where to go? Lots of stuff there. All these optional skills in Metroid that you can optimize. I mean, you saw my movement. It's just random and crazy, but they give you the tools to be incredibly precise and fast, and that's something that you would work on over time, uh, whether you're just playing the game for fun or speed running. Observation and how that makes uh, how observation in Metroidvanias differs from or Metroid differs from other Metroidvanias. Field changes in global awareness, like. Different ways that the game designs things so that you're more and more aware of the macro. And the macro being large chunks of rooms, large sections. I guess I'll show you. But the macro would be obviously the biggest sense how every one of these areas connect and what they're there for. But more so like every one of these colored zones, you could consider like a macro, right? Like a, like a continuous thematic um, chunk of level design. And then how you conceptualize it. Um, and, and how it helps you keep these things in mind without checking the map every two steps is an interesting topic. Uh, how Emmys themselves and dealing with them is a third pillar to Metroid's gameplay. Uh, run and gun, you know, exploration slash puzzle solving in terms of uh, getting all the collectibles. But then this new element, stealth, and it's an idea that was started with the SAX and Metroid Fusion, where like you're not the strongest thing in this environment, you better watch out Samus done really interestingly and really well in Dread, but there's a lot to talk about there. Uh, the map, it's kind of cluttered. <laughs> it's got a lot of colors and a lot of icons and you can hover over things and it's detailed and also maybe too detailed, but that's a whole topic we'll cover. Uh, determining damage and overall strength as you progress in a game like this is something we'll talk about. I love the 3D camera changes in the game. I wanted more of them. We'll talk about that in relation to other M. Metroid twists, like how do you take a game that's like eight, there's eight Metroid games and provide fresh twists and things and uh, in terms of gameplay, not really in terms of story, but uh, Metroid staples, we talked a little bit about that today. 
Um, I described the level design and Dread as being ant farm-like, so you can even look at it from this far distance. It's got curves, more organic curves, more um, lumpy hallways and things that really make it look like an ant farm, especially if you compare it to Metroid 1, which is hubs and spokes the game. Hallways, shafts, that's it. Not really an ant farm, but still cool in its own way. Um, hard versus soft locks. Amy, layered genius, jungle gems, contrived doors. Yeah, Metroid Dread does kind of goes overboard on doors and funneling, but it's complex and it's something we'll, we'll talk about. Uh, the save system and the ammo stations, I feel like are kind of holdovers from a different style of game and they don't really fit so much in this game but we'll consider that the fact that the game doesn't give you any tools for speed running aside like a, uh, an hours played on your save file they don't have like a clock in the corner for you they don't let you um like take notes or put beacons on the map or just about anything that you might think would be helpful for people speed running this modern version of a metroid uh, Enemy designs and new boss designs, and as Marcus mentioned, some of the bosses have some really modern and odd things that make the gameplay a little, a little bit questionable at times when you're playing Metroid. Uh, so we'll talk about what that is, enemy interplay, the little effects that it ha they have on the environment, and when the players play against them. We'll consider things like how to introduce more survival gameplay. Uh, with a game that has save stations, like how, how do you make it feel like people are are bound to lose something big or, or don't want to die when save stations are plentiful and then checkpoints are plentiful? Like how, how would you even do that? That's one thing. Uh, yeah, and, ma and many more topics, all the questions that were asked on the Discord channel, uh, we will get to, we will plop somewhere in this big diagram and you can freely uh, explore it yourself. But yeah, these are our Discord icons all the people participating in the metro discussion and maybe you'll add yours as well but yeah that's a fun coverage of what we've done so far uh, any final words before wrapping up this hour-long stream Choice between dread, so Metroid. Kind of, kind of hard to say it and have it make sense. You're right, it's better. Read. Yeah, Metroid. It's weird. Metroid. To the top. Cool. Cool. Alright, I'm just gonna play this music. Pop this on. That's cool. If I maximize it, it says Metroid in the stream feed, and then the title says Dread Week. I'm like, hey. I did that on purpose. 